Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives. My name is Heidi Kuda, and today Jim Hi-Fi and I are interviewing our friend Alex Alvarova. She, of course, if you followed us, uh, you know that she is a disinformation analyst and an author originally from the then Czechoslovakia. She is going to explain to us the insidious nature of controlled opposition, how to spot it, and why Americans need to get so much better at inoculating ourselves from information warfare. Have a listen. Alex Alvarova, we are so happy to have you back with us. As those know uh, who watch our show, uh, Alex has been here many times. She taught us about the sickness of the mind that occurs when uh, reality is always tampered with. She taught us about Zerzetsung, which is the way that the Stasi attacked journalists and dissidents and those who were actively opposing uh, the East Berlin uh, or the East Germany leadership. And we learned how instead of uh, attacking them physically, they went after them with psychological abuse and hundreds of thousands of people were employed to do this, including, I just learned, mm -hmm. even 14-year-olds. So please watch our Zerzetsung episode with Alex. But today we're going to talk about something near and dear to our heart, controlled opposition. I think there's a lack of imagination, particularly in America, on just how insidious this mirage of dissent is that's created intentionally again to alter reality alex welcome please help us <laughs> hi thanks for having me uh, it's always a pleasure to be with you guys so uh the controlled position is actually nothing new to me and nothing new to all the people who lived their lives partially in in uh, during the communist time and during with, with the soviets basically uh, first of all, I have a brilliant example from Anton Chekhovsov, an Ukrainian political scientist, who described in one of his books a situation in the late 90s when the first Moscow oligarchs financed together an avant-garde Moscow theater. It means like leftist, crazy stuff in the theater, uh, new something like very provocative and new and unheard of. And together, the fascist militia against them, uh, like uh, disturbing the theater, disturbing the play, shouting and, and uh, throwing tomatoes and making all, all, all kind of, of uh, like violent chaos around. And they did it, they financed these two parts just for fun at that time to control some kind to to bring some narrative in to to make people talk about it you know and that that was the, the, the in there was the time when information warfare was still in uh, very young there was no putin no nothing it just the very first blueprint of how the controlled opposition might work the second example uh, I remembered is from my own experience from Czech former Czechoslovakia. I got three, actually. The first one is not exactly controlled opposition. It's a forgery, but it, it's somehow... Uh, uh, i tell you what it was. Uh, after the violent communist coup 1948, uh, the communists didn't were fast enough to close the entire country with the razor wire, uh, which they did in the early 50s or so. And the first two years between 48 and 50s, they, they were busy with wiring, like with closing the country that no one can escape. And in these two first years, a lot of people, intellectuals, journalists, uh, like capitalists, people, rich Prague families, anyone who didn't want to live under their rule just went away. But it was not possible to escape through no ordinary roads. So the people escaped through deep woods on our western border to Germany. They are, there are deep swamps and woods where no one lives, like a long, long strip of wild nature 
and these people were escaping through these woods with no roads, just, just running wild uh, 20, 40 kilometers until they reached the Germany, the German territory. And what the ch secret police, the equivalent of Stasi, the Czech STB, uh, the, the, it was like the KGB, but the small one, the small sister of KGB on our territory. Uh, they invented a forgery. They called it Action Stone uh, or Code Stone. And that was in the middle of the wood behind the swamp when the people finally had the feeling that they reached the German territory, but they were still, they didn't know it because there were no signs. And they didn't know they are still on the Czech territory in the wood, in the, in the forest. So the Czech secret service put, uh, they built a small house. They borrowed American uniforms of American army. Uh, they learned, used people who talked English. And they pretended it's a territory in Western Germany where the American army already operates. So the people who escaped the long strip through the forest and through the swamp, happy that they made it. The first what they saw was this house, was this house full of American officers. And they were like, finally, friends, freedom. And they, then they invited them in that they handed them coffee and, and water and everything. And then the people started to talk and they tell them, they told them everything, you know. And the next step, of course, was the concentration camps inside of Czech Republic. So this is like, it's not wow. about exactly about controlled opposition. Um, I'm just telling you how incredibly inventive and cruel these people were. They were, wow. this is cruel, this is saddest, you know. Okay. The second one, when I was a young girl, a young journalist, I was 25, and I met this man who was uh, a member of the political prisoners in the 50s. They were different, they were different from the political prisoners in the 60s and 70s, because that time in the 70s was already a little bit eased. So there were no killings, no torture. But in the 50s, it was brutal. The people were tortured to death. With like, When you read what Taliban or ISIS does to people, they basically did the same to an ordinary, to, to Czech normies, just because of cruelty. And uh, anyone, because of talking too much or thinking and, and uh, showing in your face some disapproval, anyone could land it in the concentration camp and they tortured the people. I don't want to describe it because it was, it's horrifying. You don't want to know that. And I knew it was, he was already an old man. He was there for 13 years in the concentration camp, uh, uh, mining uranium for the Soviets, which they didn't pay for. There were huge uranium mines, uh, northern and, and western from Prague, and the people were cheap labor, so they didn't pay them. They destroyed their, they, they worked without any, uh, without any health protection or uh, radiation protection, so they, their Health was undermined. They died there like flies, uh, and, and and they mined, they mined uranium for Soviets in that mines. And he was there for thirteen long years, and he met there his mate on the cell was a man who was invited after the year forty eight by a cell of resistance to join them and to do the to do the armed resistance against the regime. So, and because the man was really brave, he was from Prague, he said, yeah, okay, I, I'm, I'm in, I'm gonna help you. And turns out after five months or six months, this armed resistance cell has been founded by Czech state secret, communist state secret service. So they entrapped brave people, they picked them, and throw them to concentration camps. So this was another and last example from after the Velvet Revolution. We had three presidents, uh, 
except of General Pavel, which is the guy who is president, Czech president right now. So the first was after the Velvet Revolution was Václav Havel. You probably heard this name. He was also a very famous writer and an incredible thinker and, and a personality with a moral integrity of somebody, like, you know? And then after Havel came two presidents who were, one was a representant of the Czech conservative Czech conservative politics, the inventor of coupon privatization in the Soviet style, and someone who was uh, famous, who became famous by his uh, by his sentence, "I don't. There are no dirty money. It's just money, and this is economics, you know." And against him was a leftist who also became our president. And uh, uh, the name of the first guy was Václav Klaus. He was a climate uh, change denier, a uh, dirty money denier, basically someone very much connected to organized crime and to the fossil lobby. The second guy was a typical leftist, like talking about working men and bad oligarchs and and the necessity to protect the workers and the ordinary the normie you know the normies and, and someone who constantly complained about the bad right oriented government who doesn't think that the, the guys up there the elites and stuff turns out both of them literally both of them were russian pawns we had these two presidents who hate who pretend to hate each other we we spent the entire country spent with their fight like on the tennis pang, 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 watching their fights for 10 years mesmerized by their hate turned out both were kremlin pawns both of them wow the kremlin was playing both sides you say both the wow. left and the right yeah wow yes Yes. <laughs> it's almost like creating a third position, as it were, uh, yeah. <laughs> which is a, exactly. a, uh, a tactic <laughs> the, of KGB. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Wow. So, well, so thank you for that. This is, um, that. That's the real example I lived, I really saw from the very beginning to be developed as a game to entertain masses. And the people yep. fell for it. It worked. It worked. Thank you so much for all of those incredible examples. I often say that I feel like there's a lack of imagination in America on just how insidious this can be. And as you yes, know, indeed. I've been reporting on the RT indictment. I've been reporting on the doppelganger affidavit where they actually explain how, uh, how much of this is done. And when you describe that first story, of controlled opposition where there's actually agitators there to disrupt an event. We have we have tomatoes thrown at us online figuratively all damn day long. And the technique that's been used now is a, a somebody who appears to be legitimate, targets one of the members of our team. We actually defend our team. And then it's used to disparage us as if we are the ones who started the fight. And it is exhausting and it is stupid. But I yeah. also think that it is indicative of just how much uh, resources are put behind trying to control the narrative and trying to keep independent reporters who are reporting the truth as we see it. Uh, to try to denigrate our work and remove us from that. And can you speak specifically about how controlled opposition is deployed in journalism? You know, uh, it's like one week or two weeks, I don't know exactly, it was the beginning of September, where two heads of the uh, British and American intel, the CIA and the MI6, spoke in the Financial Times Forum openly about the risks of the present era. And both of them said that the highest level, the, the actually the first level of our defense and also attack, that's interesting, is the narrative intelligence, the narrative warfare. In the first line, the people working in narrative warfare are in the first line of our defense and attack. So it, 
Let's translate it to the, to the, to the language of no ordinary people. It means that the highest capacity in the warfare we, where no shots are fired surrounding us right now is concentrated in the narrative, informing the narrative. It means telling people stories they can actually believe about their life, their qualities, what do they what should they think about the world surrounding them? That's the that's the top, that's the first line of the war. It means that the journalists who are actively writing and influencing, they have an incredible reach, or each journalist is like writing and influencing from thousands to million people. It's it can be scaled up, but but it's still different. Every single brain counts. So journalists are important people. And when they I'm reading a book from I'm reading a book from an American from the American public relation guy operative called the worst of all people. And He's describing how, how he worked for the most famous public relation agencies in Washington, D.C. And he remembers how he was, how the agency he worked for was hired by Russia Today, Kim.com, uh, different people just to, just to engage journalists to get a little bit piece of of, of to to divert the narrative to make it look, to make them look better or to distract from from what they do or to forming the narrative is so important because everyone who follows the media has a picture about the world according to what he consumes so if you can form the narrative you can form the action and the action is what matters so congressmen, ordinary people, other people who follow the journalists, when they, what they built in their heads, what they built, what kind of narrative and puzzle they built in their brains, they will live and act according to what they have here. So the matrix in the brain about the world, about the, the cognitive matrix is what makes us do the ordinary action in our daily life that makes us decide, do we get up from the bed or do we overthrow the government to, today? So that's the question. And everything matters. Every single piece of opinion matters. It's a puzzle. And if you have the power to form the narrative through journalists, through, through opinion makers, through influencers on different social media, through politicians, which are one of the largest influences in the information space, no one just no one just refers to them as influencers. Everyone thinks they are here to make decisions, but they are also incredible influencers because they have millions of followers. Everything what they say, and then the people in Silicon Valley and and billionaires, each single celebrity matters and when you send the opinion and they it will it's it's multiplied through the social media algorithm it forms the the way how the people think about the world we live in and that's the narrative warfare so wow if you have someone who says something you don't like you have basically you have a lot of different actions if you are in, in a propagandist or someone who knows how to how to deal with influence operations which is a term from secret services and intel you can do a lot of dirty stuff in the background so you can influence journalists you can pay influencers like we saw right now with Tim Pool and the others uh, you can blackmail someone to say something you can seduce someone to say something. You send a pretty chick to a journalist and then, you know, you say, uh, women can do a lot of stuff. There is a million of dirty methods how you can make journalists write something. Sometimes 
it it's even ideology or ego. Sometimes the people are convinced they are right. If you have someone who can daily drinking beer with the journalist and telling him, hey, you, you should pay attention this way. This guy is really evil. So we, I, I bring you... I bring you a lot of materials. You don't need to research too much. This is really, we should do something about it. You know, we should do something. I've seen many, I worked, you know, <laughs> I've worked 20 years plus in political communication. I've seen those people operating on my on the territory of my own country. They are around and they're playing in the open. You know, you know them, you know their methods, you need you know how they running around through editorials offices, uh, through the parliament uh, 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 couloirs. I don't know how to like the the uh, the halls of, of fame, you know. That they, they are everywhere. They they have their they have their strings to pull. And these methods are pretty simple. It doesn't cost too much, it just costs you time. And the knowledge you need to invest to influence these people, so you can easily create and shape the narrative and divert it from an opinion or facts you don't like. Wow, Jim. Um, I, I I used to I talked a lot about um, stories as sort of the basis of human thought and communication right i don't think i think people misunderstand the brain as like a big database of numbers and stuff and then there's a little processor on it's it's not that we literally store our memories and our our uh, instructions basically in stories right mm -hmm. so my my favorite example of the first story if you hear roaring behind a rock that means there's a saber tooth tiger and you should run away because last the, you have a story in your head yeah. about hearing yeah, that exactly. and then somebody got eaten. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's, just the, so there's a reason, right. For, for yeah. having yeah, the story and having it part of us. Now, let me give an example of controlled opposition and see if this makes sense. So you're a caveman and you hear roaring behind the, behind the rock. And another caveman says, oh, don't worry about that. That's just my buddy, right? But it turns out this caveman is actually an agent of the saber-toothed tiger. And because you're distracted over here, the saber-toothed tiger comes over here and eats you. Now, that's a dumb example. But I think, I think in its basic form, right, this is what it is. It's basically yeah. somebody pretending to be part of your side, as it were, mm -hmm. and yeah. intentionally steering you in the direction of the danger that you're yeah. trying to avoid in the first yeah. place yeah. and or disrupting your ability to, you know, um, combat the danger that you're, you're trying to face. Um, we've, we've been out here, as you know, on the sort of front lines of this narrative war um, for a long time. Um, I just wanted to get your sort of your advice because I've looked up to, to you a lot and seen you out there fighting the narrative war yourself. What, what, are, what are some pieces of advice you can give our viewers just sort of in, you know, in, on social media, in their daily lives? Um, you know, what are some tactics that you've found that, that allow people to kind of discern, oh, wait, <laughs> this guy is trying to get me eaten by the saber-toothed tiger as opposed to this is my friend who's going to warn me about it. Does you know, uh, yeah, it makes sense, but I'm afraid I cannot give any simple advice because it's incredibly it's complicated. I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> it, it takes a lot of experience to... To immediately recognize who doesn't have a good good intentions when when you speak with someone on the social media, it takes time to recognize the, these people in the first after first few sentences. It takes time. You need this experience. You need to do it again and again and again after you gain the cognitive experience, and then you know, okay, that's the same pattern. Yeah, let's get rid. Let's block him. Let's let's get rid of him. Uh, 
but basically, you know, uh, it's also a matter of culture. Uh, please don't take me wrong. I I'll be maybe, and don't, don't take it too hostile, but Americans are so gullible. It, they oh, are so no, 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 no. We're not, nobody's taking that. You, you, you can be find them right. so easy. It's so They're like they, they think because of they are the one of the strongest and largest nation in the world that there are no threats. They are they are absolutely safe on their own space, and there would be no. Why would anyone lie to them? You know, why would anyone lie to me to a representative of the strongest state of the North Atlantic Treaty? I am the one I have guns. I have we are 30 million, we are 300 million people. We have everything. Why would anyone dare to play with us? You know, and this is this is the weakness, this is the largest weakness, the, the Russians, but not only Russians, all the enemies of, of you guys. That's what they see, and they hit it, this point. They hit it. They keep hitting it. Your gullible goodness. You, you are very good people. You cannot believe that there are nations, cultures, and players on the scene who have bad intentions, evil methods, and who are really, really cruel just for fun. La you know? Lack of imagination, right? It's people it's, it's people so can't hard believe. to understand because it's not in you. Most of you are like, we are okay. You must be okay too. No, yeah. no. They are nations, cultures, actors, and people who are evil, literally, who are evil. They have evil intentions, they have evil actions, and they want evil, and they spread evil, and they drive you to evil actions too. They seduce you to evil actions too. That's what they do because they like it, or they can do it for money, or they can do it for because of compromise, because there's some pedophiles or uh, like having two lovers or being or be, being homosexual and not getting out of the closet. There are millions of reasons how can your enemies push the people inside of your country to do evil with them, to play with them. But please don't be so gullible. Be more paranoid. It pays off. It pays off. Well, I appreciate that because only recently have I decided to ruthlessly put my own mental health and well-being above any of this. So if something's fishy, I block. Yeah. If, if, if something agitates me, I block. And what, what we don't have, Alex, is what you just described, is we have no inoculation against information warfare. We are naive and gullible, and we know this because if you talk to any older adults in America, they are being fed narrative warfare, but they don't understand it. So many of them think that they are patriots, and Jim and Hi-Fi and I keep looking at the list in the affidavit, which shows all the narratives that the Russians are uh, pushing in order to provoke uh, pro-Russian sentiment in America, which is sold as patriotism. Anyway, I really appreciate what you just said. High fidelity. So I, I have some questions for you since you have firsthand experience in this. And I am simply literally a computer guy from Ohio. I'm not a disinfo expert. Yes, I was a troll back on the chance in the day, but I'm not an expert. Anyway, um, so one of the things that occurred and, and that I have multiple instances of are legitimate journalists taking the work that we do on this program and either only reporting some of it, like hiding things by omission, undermining the rationality and credibility and understanding of our work by twisting the narrative about what was said and what this expresses. And uh, the final one is direct attacks 
where we are called conspiracy theorists, where we are called, uh, you know, unreliable or your your facts aren't right or, you know, provide receipts over and over and over and over. Um, are these examples of things that existed in the past in Czechoslovakia, in East Germany, in, in the history of Russian operations to yep. undermine native populations. Yep, I, I tell you two examples. The one, it, 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 I know it will be uh, egoistic to start with myself, but I've been called conspiracist for like since 2014 when the Russians for the first time attacked Ukraine, and I, I, I was saying. I, I was trying to explain anyone that we are in the warfare. And every, even my friends and the Democrats in the Czech Republic told me that I'm seeing, I see Russians under my bed. <laughs> and it's, I'm, I'm totally, I'm a conspiracist or I'm crazy. Com I'm part of Red, Reds under the bed. Reds under the bed. Yes, yes, right. yes. So this is, they keep calling that after how the years went and I published two books and people read them, most of them realized I was right and apologized, but still. And the, the people on the other part of the barricade, they just doubled down. She is dangerous. She is a conspiracist, you know? And, and this is something I got used to, but uh, at, the, at my last speech in Prague, which I appreciated very much, the chairman, a lady who I really, who I really respect, she's a very well known for her. Is she's a scientist, nuclear scientist, and the chairman of the Czech nuclear uh, department. I don't know how to translate it. It's something about the Department of Nuclear Energy, and she visits all my speeches in when I'm in Prague. And last time she told me, you know. You know how do you what is what does it mean when they stab you in the back and they kick you in the back? It means you are forward. You are the first. You are in the. You are the first. That's good. That's a good sign. So this is first experience, and the second is actually. You know, we have right now. The S everywhere in the world, a problem with with the hack of conservative thinking. It, it, it Czech, Czech Republic is not the exemption, so it's 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 going ongoing. It's everywhere, uh, and the everyone knows in the former communist bloc that the leftist and communist ideology is basically bad. We have the inoculation. But because Reagan and Thatcher were the winners of the Cold War, we have some kind of Stockholm syndrome to cherish and bow to conservatism as some ideology which saved us from communism. And it's indisputable. It's holy. We don't touch that. We don't even poke that. It's holy. It's like everyone... It's a, it's a holy cow. I'm not a leftist. I'm a Catholic and conservative too. But I can see and document how the hack of the conservative narrative occurred from the 90s until today. And it has been so perverted that it basically, even in Czech Republic, which has nothing to do with America in that narrative, it hit us. With what Steve Bannon said, yeah, you know, conservative, uh, the conservative religion is basically very shallow. It's just guns, whiteness, uh, abortions, and no taxes. And this is what we perceive as conservatism in the Czech Republic right now. And we still keep bow and cherish, like trickle down economy, Reagan, Thatcher, without even disputing, the, not knowing the facts behind. We don't know that the Republican presidents messed up the budget and that they, uh, how they dealt with the economy. We don't know that. And we are not interested because it's holy, it's sacred. They saved us, you know? This is how it works. And the, right now, we have two conservative media on the right part of the spectrum, very popular, and 
wait for it, who are making like fandom for Ukraine, who are against Russia. But every single time when there is some kind of dangerous situation, they take the wrong part. You know, right now they are, they take the wrong side, not the wrong part. They take the wrong side. Right now we have the worst floodings since 100 years in the middle of Europe. The entire Austria, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and the part of Poland and Germany are under the water. It's horrifying. It's already, and it, it's already repeating after 10 years. It's coming on more often because of the climate change. And a lot of thousands of people lost their homes. It's a horrible tragedy. Guess what these media did two, three days when the entire meteorological models were already known, they said, oh, it's going to be nothing. The government is just making, it's just telling you, you know, uh, they are just trying to shock you and uh, don't leave your homes and don't prepare. It's going to be okay. They are exaggerating. This is a hysteria. How can you explain such behavior when they call themselves conservative. How can you explain? Just picking a narrative or picking a danger, coming closer and making everything to make it worse. You know, the same with COVID. This is hysteria and mass hysteria. Don't be afraid. Don't like, they are doing everything to make the situation worse, but officially they are against Russia or they are for Ukraine, but they just mess everything up. They are messing with people's heads, doing the dirty work beneath. The subtle manipulations that people don't really understand. Yeah, It's a thing that people, that uh, I see that people don't understand is that there are people that play a part all the time, right? They play the part of being pro Ukraine. Ukraine and anti-Russia specifically so they can do this at these times. Yeah. And, and, and part listen, of the, part of the this failure is hard magic. to understand for Americans because they are it so is hard. open and right people, you know. And it's the most, so I'll, let me give you my, my brief example. Some people who are supposedly against, you know, fascism and violence and all of that. When I predicted January 6th ahead of time, I had a bunch of people out there saying, oh, stop worrying about it. The most dangerous thing that's going to happen is COVID. Wow. That guy's balloon on. That's a conspiracy theorist. Don't listen to him. Yeah. I, have the, um, I can show you. And these are the same people that profess to be experts in disinformation and experts in the field. But when it comes to these moments, they're flat wrong. And they're wrong in the most dangerous possible way. So, um, you know, I, I, Boom. I, I feel that there is a, uh, uh, you know, a meeting of, of divines here anyway. Um, Me too. Uh, you guys, I just, this is the part where I always ask if you'll come back. Cause I always feel like we just scratched the surface as we are finishing these interviews. So Alex, come back. Any final <laughs> words or final warnings from anybody here? on the subject of the lack of imagination on how insidious controlled opposition is. And as Jim and Alex just described, particularly when they point everybody in the wrong direction at the most critical moments in time. Uh, it's, uh, it's a quote from the Bible. After their fruit, you will recognize them. So it means when you see the consequences of their action, when it makes more harm, more chaos, more pain, and more, uh, like when it damages America, <sighs> who are they? What do they do? Why? For whom? I can't think of a better ending. Thank you so much, Alex Alvarova, for your lived experience and your ability to eloquently share it with our viewers. 